So friends and colleagues, good afternoon, everyone. Buonasera or buenas tardes. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the long weekend. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce our 26th day of uh, or 26th lecture of our liver imaging online series. Today is a very special day. Uh, it's my honor and the pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Dr. Amir Borani. So, Dr. Borani is an assistant professor in the University of Pittsburgh. The Department of Radiology, University of Pittsburgh. He's also the chief of body CT in the University of Pittsburgh. He received his medical degree from Tehran, University of Medical Sciences. He subsequently finished his residency as well as uh, a research and clinical fellowship in abdominal imaging at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. His clinical and research areas of interest include diffuse and focal liver disease, liver transplantation, and quantitative imaging. Amir is a very nice person, very, very polite uh, um, friend, and really very polite guy. You learn from him how to uh, be polite. Uh, very difficult to reach his uh, like degree of humbleness and uh, mild manners and uh, politeness. Uh, of note, Amir is moving to Chicago. I tried to recruit him to Amidi Anderson. Unfortunately, he didn't join us. He is moving to Northwestern, a great university, great hospital in Chicago. He's going to be an associate professor and the chief of Body CT. Um, he is author of many uh, peer review publications and, and the textbook, and uh, he is very well known lecturer and uh, researcher in, in the field of diagnostic radiology, particularly in liver imaging. Uh, without further ado, I would like to ask uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Burani, to start his lecture, which is going to be Imaging Evaluation of Liver Transplantation. Amir? Thank you very much, Khaled. Uh, well, thank you very much for the nice words. Uh, I hope I, um, um, the, you know, they're true. So, uh, well, thank you very much for giving me the honor uh, to be part of this series. I've heard a lot of good things. I've watched a couple of them online, uh, like YouTube, after hours, but I've heard many good things from my colleagues um, in different institutions. Uh, and also, I would like to thank um, the DFB, HCC, and uh, ACR Lyrads, um, again, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so Khalid uh, asked me to talk about imaging of liver transplant. Initially, we were planning to cover pre- and post-transplant uh, topics, but then we decided that it's hard to do the justice to cover all of them in our hour and a half session. So we decided to just focus on pre-transplant, mainly on uh, living donor candidates. And I thought that that would be also a good transition for the speaker tomorrow, which is Dr. Abby Homar, great person, great friend, and a great surgeon who will talk about more of a surgeon perspective of um, liver transplantation. And so, are my disclosures. Uh, so, talk about the background. Uh, again, uh, we'll be focusing on living donor uh, liver transplant imaging workup. Uh, we talk about the imaging techniques and protocols and uh, pros and cons for each of them. Uh, we go over surgical techniques, what is relevant for radiologists and the surgical anatomy, which I think is very important to know, to know why we're doing this sort of imaging and what information we need to convey. Uh, and we review some pertinent vascular and biliary normal variations, uh, which are important to know and to report. Uh, we can't talk about transplant uh, without mentioning the name of Thomas Starzl, and I, I was honored to know him and work with him. So he was the father of transplantation in the world, and he, he's the person who did the first liver transplantation. Uh, he did it successfully for the first time in 1967 when he was at the University of Colorado, and then he moved to Pittsburgh, and he established the first uh, established uh, transplant program at 1981. He passed away uh, two years ago. Um, and as we know, liver transplantation is a definite treatment for NSH liver disease and for certain um, uh, hepatocellular carcinomas. And uh, the rate of transplantation has been on rise. Uh, 
but obviously there has been issues with the availability of um, deceased donor because there's a limit on that and more and more centers are doing this uh, transplantation nowadays so there is competition for getting the graft and there's always shortage of uh, graft this is from deceased donor and also there is a sh uh, very very long list for for waiting list so so as a solution people came up with living donor transplantation and this is nothing new it's been around for more than 20 years but uh, recently it's been more more attention to it for adults uh, in the United States. So if you look at the numbers, the numbers look pretty steady, but uh, if you break it down, uh, many of them are um, pediatrics, but if you look at the numbers for adults, in many centers, um, it's been on rise. So in uh, Pittsburgh, um, in past couple of years, they're doing around like 60, 70 cases per year. And again, Abby Humor will talk about those information a little bit more tomorrow. So pre-op evaluation of living liver donor candidates, why are we doing it? So the purpose, one is for eligibility of the donor to make sure that that person is eligible to donate part of his or her, 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 her liver. And also in some cases, some patients are lucky to have multiple donors and then surgeons and transplant team can decide which donor to, to, to choose. Uh, and the issues that look at will be the liver size, the general health of the liver in terms of parenchymal disease and focal disease, and also incidental findings that are, that are important and relevant to exclude a patient and make that person un, um, ineligible. And more importantly, we do this imaging uh, to give the surgeons a roadmap. So they use it to plan to be prepared um, for this surgery. And uh, one of my great colleagues always says that this is a surgery that if it goes wrong, two people will be hurt, the donor and the recipient. So it's very, very important to be, um, to do a diligent work and to know exactly what they're doing beforehand. Uh, in terms of size for the eligibility of the donors, there are studies show that if the future remnant liver, which means that the portion of the liver which is left in the uh, donor's body, if it's less than 30%, uh, that is, increases the risk uh, of complications significantly. And that was based on the hepatectomy uh, patients, the patients who had hepatectomy for um, other indications, not necessary for being a, a donor. Uh, but that's usually not the case. Usually, like they do either left lateral segment resection or um, lobectomy. So most of the time, the patient ends up having more than 30%. So that's really an issue for exclusion of a patient to be a donor. Um, diffuse and focal liver pathology. So um, obviously, that implies the health of the liver. And that's probably what more important. And one of the important topics to talk about will be steatosis. So um, studies show that uh, the people, the donors who have a steatosis, that's an independent risk factor for post-epitectomy complication uh, in the donor. And also there's an issue that that graph won't be an optimum graph for the recipient. So that's something that we have to pay attention uh, and look at. Um, the other thing will be the, the incidental uh, important extrahepatic findings that could exclude the patient, uh, such as patient having uh, malignancy or active infection, and also vascular pathologies that sometimes they are, they are pretty subtle, so I think that's something that we have to pay attention. Uh, this is a case that we had um, a couple years ago, a potential donor, and the liver looked fine, the anatomy was uh, pretty good for uh, transplantation, but we had this incidental finding of fibromuscular dysplasia, or FMD. So basically, this patient has some inherent underlying vascular pathology, which might put this patient at risk um, of uh, losing one of his kidneys or like an other organs down the road. So this patient was excluded to be a donor. The main importance of preoperative planning, though, is for surgical planning and for roadmap. Uh, so the, the, the surgeons, based on the imaging, they decide uh, what type of epitectomy to do. And there are different types of epitectomy that we'll cover uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, they decide to do a right epitectomy or a left epitectomy or left lateral segmentectomy. So that basically dictates what type of um, procedure to do. And also by looking at the biliary anatomy and vascular anatomy, uh, that also affect their transection plane and also uh, they can decide and 
to be prepared for what type of anastomosis and how many number of anastomosis to have. Uh, these are some examples that again uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss later. But this is a patient with uh, aberrant right um, anterior hepatic duct going all the way down. So the surgeon knows if they do right hepatectomy, and this will be their transfection plane. They end up having two ducts, so that necessitates having two biliary and uh, enteric anastomosis. Or this patient, we have um, an accessory hepatic artery. Uh, so these are like pertinent uh, findings for the surgeons. And this is a case of accessory right hepatic vein and also a large uh, draining vein of segment eight. And again, we'll, we'll try to cover these uh, during this talk. The surgical anatomy, uh, in our institution, the most commonly performed technique would be right hepatectomy. So that means that uh, they use the middle hepatic vein intraop by ultrasound and just go one centimeter posterior to it. So that would be the plane of transfection. So the donor with, will be left with the middle hepatic vein, the left hepatic vein, and the graft will have only the right hepatic vein. So uh, if you look at the post-surgical anatomy, the recipient, you have right hepatic vein, right portal vein and um, the right hepatic ducts, which, will, which could be one or two. These patients always get biliary enteric anastomosis. That's a favorite, uh, favorite technique for, for reconstruction. Um, in other cases, they might opt to do left hepatectomy. In this case, usually the transfection plane is anterior to the middle hepatic vein, and then the graph will include only the left hepatic vein uh, again, left portal vein, duct, and artery. But again, these are really institution-based. So uh, there are techniques that they use the right lobe, but they take both the right hepatic vein and middle hepatic vein. So it's very, very important to know this, the technique that your surgeons do uh, and also communicate with them. Uh, and as we'll discuss later, the pertinent anatomy uh, will be affected by the type of surgery and the technique that they do. Uh, what are the goals of imaging evaluation of this candidate? So we want to be able to evaluate the liver parenchyma mainly for steatosis, I think fibrosis as well, but most of the donors are relatively healthy and younger, so usually fibrosis is not a major issue. And they're already screened based on medical history. So when they come to us for imaging, they've already selected and they, they end up being uh, like healthier population. Uh, we should be evaluate should be able to evaluate the hepatic vasculatures, the biliary tree, and also at the same time look for uh, incidentals outside the liver. Uh, and we have different options. Obviously, there is CT, MRI. You can do uh, MR angiography with and without contrast. Uh, also added intraoperative angiogram because uh, many centers they routinely do it anyway. Um, before the transaction to confirm the biliary anatomy. And each of these has uh, uh, cons and pros. So uh, CT, obviously, it's good for parenchyma, not as good as MRI, but it's very good for uh, looking at the arterial anatomy specifically, also good for veins, but probably MRI is better for evaluation of veins, as we'll discuss uh, later. Uh, CT is not good for delineation of biliary tree, so that's the disadvantage of CT. Uh, and CT, obviously, you can just evaluate the pelvis and other organs pretty fast. Uh, MRI, on the other hand, the forte will be evaluation of liver parenchyma. Uh, again, you can evaluate the biliary tree by MRI, and you need to complement it by um, MR angiography. And based on this, you can come up with different protocols. You can do CT plus IOC, and that's actually most uh, uh, centers that don't do this anymore. They, they like to know the biliary tree beforehand, uh, and that means that they do MRI, uh, MRCP. Uh, most of centers are doing CT with MRC and some other centers that do MRI slash MRC plus minus CT that we'll, we'll talk later. Uh, so CT, uh, we need to do a multiphasic protocol. Uh, uh, many institutions do do non-contrast for detection of osteotosis, but if you are doing MRI as part of the evaluation, probably you can uh, uh, omit that phase, and that's what we did. Uh, that was part of our protocol for years, but um, as of a few years ago, we don't do uh, non-con anymore since we're doing ideal IQ and protein density fat fraction. So you have 
basically the best tool for fat fraction, and that way we are reducing the dose. You need to have an early arterial phase um, and make sure that from technique um, perspective, you have to have a technically adequate arterial phase in terms of timing, in terms of usually lower pitch uh, to increase your higher, you know, increase your spatial uh, resolution. And we, we do need to have a good venous phase for delineation of the poro vein and hepatic vein um, and to be able to make reformers out of them. And also for this type of surgery, the patient uh, and the surgeons need to know the liver volume. So segmentation is part of this, and uh, we can discuss later, but this could be done either by radiology techs, by radiologists, and I heard some centers, the surgeons will take care of it. So as long as they have the source images, they can take care of that. Advantage of the CT, it has the highest resolution, uh, especially when you're talking to the CTA. It is less prone to artifacts and motion, so you end up having more consistent uh, imaging, especially if you're talking about a center with less experience, probably that would be the easiest uh, way to start with. Uh, there's less variability in image quality between different centers. The limitations, it's on a, uh, on ability to evaluate the biliary anatomy, and uh, in, in some cases, the contrast resolution for evaluation of hepatic veins is not, might not be um, perfect because by the time you wait to see contrast in the hepatic veins, you're in equilibrium phase, and then the contrast between the veins and surrounding tissue might not be perfect. Um, MR cholangiography is mainly based on uh, high T titulated, like heavily titulated images. So we can do two two dimensional and three dimensional MR um, cholangiography, and this is a representative uh, representative uh, protocol that we do in in my institution. Uh, so the 2D MRC is single breath hold, so it's less prone to motion, uh, but it has lower spatial resolution, and it's a very fast sequence. It gives you thicker slab. Uh, of MIP look um, uh, biliary tree. And we, we usually do it in different projections. Usually it starts at 7 o'clock position, goes to 11 o'clock. So you, you have uh, somewhere between seven to uh, 5 to 7 projections and can look at the biliary tree. Uh, and it's a good way of having an overall global look at the biliary tree. Uh, 3D MRC, on the other hand, will give you higher spatial resolution, so it's better for evaluation of tiny branching just to know where they are coming. Obviously, it's much thinner. Many times we can get it at overlap. And uh, since it takes more time, it has to be respiratory triggered and navigator gated. And most centers, they, they complement the MRC with other sequences, mostly with axiom and coronal um, uh, single shot, T2 weighted and also T1 weighted. Uh, the concept of contrast enhanced MRC is based on the hepatobiliary excretion of contrast. So certain type of GAD-based contrast have uh, uptake by hepatocytes, usually through the OATP uh, receptors, and then after uh, minutes they start excreting into the biliary canaliculi. So if you wait long enough, you end up seeing that uh, excreted contrast within the biliary tree. Uh, uh, the Galatate acid or EOS or Primovis in other parts of the world outside the United States, that's usually the preferred one. It has like 50% biliary excretion, and usually you can catch the hepatobiliary phase within 20 minutes or so, versus Malton has um, the other hepatobiliary agent. It only has 5% biliary excretion, and you have to wait more than an hour to to, to get to that phase. Uh, so EOS is a prefer preferred uh, uh, agent that many many centers are using, and uh, what's the benefit of it? Uh, when you wait for like 20 minutes or so, and you start to see, uh, so you start to see very high contrast the uh, material within the biliary tree and surrounded by lower signal liver. So it gives you a very high inherent contrast resolution. And also the acquisition is like 3D T1 weighted, so usually you have pretty high quality, high spatial resolution acquisition. So this combination will end up with good quality uh, images that gives you both high spatial and contrast resolution. And, and many of these patients, or the 
the donors, the not patients, uh, they are healthier, so they don't have biliary dilatation, and sometimes seeing the small biliary radicals might be hard on MRCP. Uh, so sometimes this could actually add value and uh, make it easier uh, to see and to delineate the biliary anatomy. Uh, so a comparison of 2D MRC, 3D MRC, and contrast MRC, special resolution is highest in the um, uh, contrast enhanced MRC. The special resolution is highest between uh, basically for contrast enhanced MRC and 3D. Uh, but the added value here is that the acquisition time for contrast enhanced MRC is, sh is much shorter, so it's less prone to respiratory motion and respiratory artifact. It's an example of a case uh, patient, we started with 2D MRC, and this is the quality you get. Um, and uh, the first attempt of 3D MRC, uh, patient was not able to um, cooperate with breathing instructions, so it's very, very motiony. The second attempt is better, but still it's not the perfect um, special resolution. And this patient had contrast enhanced MRC, and uh, this is a MIP, but if you look at the single images, they're pretty good resolution images that they, they really help with uh, ass assessment of the biliary tree. MRI, obviously MRI is a multi-parametric method, so it's a one-shop evaluation for the liver parenchyma. So you can evaluate the diffuse diseases uh, as best as possible by imaging. So for steatosis, by chemical ship imaging, and uh, newer sequences that let you to do more quantitative uh, fat fraction. So it's like you know perfect for that purpose. Uh, for fibrosis, uh, we don't do MRI elastography as part of a protocol. As I said, most of our patients are pre-selected, so they're usually younger and healthier. So the odds that they have significant fibrosis is very low, but um, you know, something that it could be thought of to include in the protocol. Uh, since we're doing ideal IQ uh, for fat fraction, we, we automatically get the R2 star map for iron deposition. But again, uh, the odds of these patients or these donors um, have uh, abnormal or interposition is very, very low, but it's something that we are given for free based on their protocols. Uh, what type of contrast to use? Um, so there's a debate between extracellular versus hepatobiliary uh, contrast. Uh, so um, the extracellular one uh, obviously will give you a better quality arterial and venous phase images, uh, but you won't have the legacy of having the delayed MRC versus hepatobiliary it will give you the MRC. And in some cases, uh, regular MRC might be enough, but in some other cases, those contrast enhanced MRC could be problem solving. And you, you don't know beforehand. So many institutions, uh, including us, we use the extracellular, uh, I'm sorry, the hepatobiliary agent so that um, we know how we know that we have the contrast MRC just in case, and also it's important to know that the biliary anatomy is very very important um, just uh, because the tiny bile ducts can affect the resection uh, plan and surgical approach significantly. Uh, this is a case of the patient had CT and MRI in the same setting. There was a lesion, a tiny calcification next to it. Uh, obviously, this is a small lesion by CT, even with multiphasic CT end up being indeterminate. So it was too small to characterize. But on MRI, you can see the lesion. It's uh, barely seen on in phase, but on a post phase, you have a signal drop, and this is the fat map you're seeing. It's composed of fat. So this is a um, pseudolipoma of Gleason capsule, which is a benign. So Again, importance of having MRI for one shop, one stop uh, evaluation of the liver. The advantage of MRI is obviously it's very comprehensive for evaluation of parenchyma. It has a better contrast resolution for evaluation of hepatic veins. And I'll show you some examples that MRI is really helping with better delineation of hepatic veins anatomy. The limitations uh, MRI has lower 
special resolution than CTA inherently. In many cases, you can argue that I'm getting enough information by that, but there are some cases that uh, might not enough. Um, it is prone to respiratory motion. Uh, uh, and the, I think the most important issue with MR is that it needs a lot more technical expertise. So it needs to be done in a center that they have a lot of information, a lot of um, experience with MRI, and they have to really fine tune their protocol to do the whole thing with MRI. Okay, so the challenge of the hepatic berry agent um, that we, we discussed so those lower quality of uh, post-contrast phases, especially the arterial phase. And this is partly because of the inherent higher relaxivity of the uh, EOS mainly. So you have to give like lower dose and lower injection time. So you have smaller time to catch the good arterial phase. Also, because of the same reason, the high contrast C can cause uh, cause gips or truncation artifact. And also, there are up to 8%, 10% cases of reported transient severe motion. So, especially during the arterial phase after injection, this patient get this severe motion that can uh, affect the quality of uh, arterial phase significantly. But there are some new promising sequences. There are faster sequences such as DISCO or Caprina House. So basically, they are compressed sense and the parallel imaging that they they, uh, they let you just do core images much faster with higher SNR, and they can actually be problem solving in, in many cases. Uh, this is an example of um, MRI protocol. Uh, with EOS, and this is with just like you know regular um, MRI protocol, um, and you can see the quality of the image. So this patient had uh, severe respiratory motion, and the quality of MRI is not the best. Uh, and uh, with this approach, you only have one chance to get MRA, the arterial phase. This is the venous phase, and this is the CT on the same patient in the same setting. Obviously, CT is offering much better spatial resolution and more consistent for uh, arterial anatomy. And this is a fairly recent case that we use one of the newer um, uh, protocols uh, with DISCO, a 3D DISCO. So it allows us to acquire images much faster and with higher SNR. So instead of one arterial phase, you're able to capture almost three, two to three arterial phase. So you have more chances to look at the arteries. Uh, and also because of the uh, more rapid acquisition is less prone to motion artifacts. So you have better delineation of the hepatic artery. And this patient has a replaced right hepatic artery, which courses posterior to the portal vein. And you have a nice look at this case, uh, the venous phase, and this is a CT on the same patient. So what imaging protocol to use? Uh, it really it really uh, depends on your uh, institution, your resources, and your expertise. So there are different combinations. I think all of them are OK, uh, depending on those factors. Uh, it looks like most places are doing multiphasic CTA and complemented by MRC with or without contrast for the biliary. Uh, there are. Uh, Few institutions that they they have uh, basically consolidated MRI MRC and they get all the information based on that, including the arterial anatomy, and some other institutions, including us, we are still doing CT just because we had some inconsistencies to get good quality uh, arterial phase with MRI. So because of that, as of now, we're still doing CTA uh, on top of the MRI. Just make sure that uh, we can get all the information one stop. Uh, but as I said, there is potential to do all the information, get all the information by MRI, MRC in one setting, and there are many centers that are doing it. Uh, one important thing is that uh, whatever acquisition and technique you do, you have to be prepared um, to have um, good quality source images for advanced multiplanar and volume rendered reformats, and also uh, to provide for liver segmentation and volumetric um, uh, assessment. This is a representative imaging protocol that we do at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we omitted uh, the non-con, so we don't do non-con CT anymore. We have the arterial phase. This is an early arterial phase. Um, we do with smart prep. Uh, and as I said, uh, we try to lower the pitch, uh, change the technique, make sure that they have 
the highest uh, or as high as possible spatial resolution with lower pitch and uh, uh, lower noise index. In the Venus phase, usually we do 40 to 50 seconds delay after the arterial phase. Uh, and again, we, we make sure that we have the, the thinnest possible um, images as source images that we're going to use for multiplanar reformats and post-processing. And uh, the, the reformatting are done mostly by our technologists in our 3D lab, and basically they just do the, uh, the uh, standard coronal and sagittal uh, reformats at two millimeter. They do MIPS, they do volume rendering of the arteries, and some oblique NPRs of portal and hepatic veins. And also, our technologists will take care of liver segmentation and volume calculation. And on top of it, when we do see any uh, variant, significant variant anatomy or pertinent variant anatomy, uh, we, we might add some other reformats ourselves. The radiologists might do it. Our MRI, uh, we use EOS, we use get Exodate, uh, and the sequences we do, we use the axial and coronal T2. We, we tend to do axial um, FSSP. We use Fiesta by GE. Uh, we use IDLIQ for fat fraction uh, for quantitative imaging of uh, evaluation of uh, steatosis. Uh, and then uh, we do the MRC uh, sequences, 2D, 6 lab, 3D respiratory triggered MRC for biliary tree. And then we do our dynamic images, T1 weighted, pre and post contrast. Uh, usually we do with lava flex or disco, depending on the scanner. And then we do a 20 minute, we do the delayed hepatobiliary phase, we do axio and coronal lava uh, for contrast enhanced MRC, basically. Uh, for this part, I'm just going to go over some pertinent variant anatomies that is important to know and important to report uh, in our. Uh, radiology reports. Uh, so we're going to go uh, over biliary uh, anatomy, hepatic arterial anatomy, hepatic venous, and portal venous. Uh, biliary anatomy is very important. One of most common causes post-hepatectomy complications are biliary aberrancies and biliary complications. Uh, variant biliary anatomy, very common, mostly affecting the right lobe branching. Uh, it's a common source of complication. Uh, and many of these variant anatomies can dictate the type of epitectomy and also end up with having two different biliary enteric anastomoses. This is important to know them beforehand to be prepared for the type of anastomosis and to be uh, to decide what transection plane to use. Uh, there, there are different um, classification systems. Uh, probably it's much easier just to be descriptive. Uh, this is. Uh, a representative based on a Greek cohort is based on autopsy on 70-something patients, and this is uh, the prevalence that they had. This is a conventional, and then you see the other types. But there are many times that we see on daily basis, and they're not defined on any of this classification. So again, it's much better to be descriptive. This is a conventional branching pattern. This is the um, MIP images from 2D MRC in the donor, and you can see um, the CBD, CHD, you have a right hepatic duct, this is the posterior, this is the right anterior branch, and then you have the left hepatic duct with branching. And same patient, this is the MIP from uh, post-contrast MRC with EOVIST, again, delineating the same anatomy. Uh, this is an intrapcholangiogram after hepatectomy. So you see some clips there already decided to do right hepatectomy, they're ligating the proximal right hepatic duct. This is uh, something that our surgeons do just to make sure there's no leak and no tiny um, uh, biliary radical somber that they were not aware of. And that's just before doing completing the, uh, the transaction. And this is the transaction plane through the right hepatic duct for patients uh, with conventional branching pattern. And as you can see, the patient would end up with having one biliary enteric anastomosis. Uh, this is a uh, cholangiogram in the recipient, so that part of the liver, which is the right lobe, now is here, and then you see the right hepatic duct, and then right anterior, right posterior branches. Another example of pertinent uh, 
biliary um, uh, variant biliary anatomies. Uh, so this is another type, the right posterior branch, instead of draining into the right hepatic duct, it is draining to the left hepatic duct. And this is the schematic. Obviously, uh, if the, the surgeon decides to do right hepatectomy, this is the transection plane. And again, patient will end up having two different bile ducts and will require most likely two biliary enteric anastomosis. Uh, Another example here, it's like a low-lying right anterior, goes all the way down, close to cystic duct confluence. And again, if they do right hepatectomy, then patient will require two biliary enteric anastomosis. Uh, and other examples here, this is uh, near trifurcation or trifurcation basically is a very short or non-existent right hepatic duct. And again, if they do uh, right hepatectomy, then uh, the surgeons will know that most likely they, they require to do two biliary enteric anastomosis. And this is a very rare case. Uh, I've seen a couple of these so far. Uh, the right posterior is draining to the cystic duct. So rare, but again, very, very pertinent uh, for this type of surgery. And additional examples, this is the uh, right uh, so this is a little bit more more complex uh, that again you can't use that classification so that's why that I think it's better just to be descriptive uh, rather than using any of those classification numbers and in this patient the right posterior hepatic duct instead of draining to the right is draining to the left but also there is a left medial hepatic duct which is draining segment four and it comes all the way down to this area of trifurcation and same patient you know you see on um, hepatobiliary phase contrast enhanced mrc and again it's a little bit more complex biliary anatomy Now we move on to hepatic arterial anatomy. Uh, the variant anatomy uh, has reported prevalence of up to 50%. There are different classification system. Again, I think it's the best to be descriptive. Michelle's and Hyatt uh, classifications are the most commonly used. Um, Hyatt is based on 1,000 patients. Michelle's is based on 700 patients. One thing is that uh, Hyatt, which is the largest one, is uh, based on the extrahepatic appearance of the vessel, so they couldn't decide if it is an accessory or replace hepatic artery. So they don't take that into account. And, and none of them are really looking at the branching inside the liver. Uh, so basically, um, the, the, this is the, uh, the, the conventional one that you have a single proper hepatic artery, a single right uh, and left hepatic artery. Uh, and um, uh, and then they branches to the anterior posterior medial lateral uh, branches. Uh, the other types will be having an accessory uh, left hepatic artery coming off of the left gastric. And accessory means that when you have uh, the, the main one present, and this is an extra to it, so that will be accessory, replaces when it's like completely replaced, so the main one is not there, and this is the sole supplier. Now. So that's the terminology for accessory versus uh, replace hepatic artery. Uh, so we're looking for any replacer accessory coming off of the uh, left gastric artery, and also we're looking for accessory or replace coming off of the uh, SMA usually. So these are the most common variations. But also very important to talk about the uh, branching pattern inside the liver. And I think that's the part that sometimes it's missed. And I've seen you know, some reports and uh, you know, something that you know, we don't comment on it. But for this type of surgery, I think this is very important to know. And one important uh, branch that we need to pay attention is the branch uh, supplying segment four, because that uh, usually um, affects the plane of transaction. The most common form that we have is the uh, the segment four branches coming off uh, is uh, coming off of the left, uh, but there are many subtypes that you're seeing that the segment four branch is coming off of the right. And I'm going to show you some some examples of it. Uh, this is a fairly conventional uh, branching pattern. So again, aorta, you have the common hepatic artery is almost trifurcation to the left and a right hepatic artery. But if you look at the intrahepatic branching pattern, you see that the right hepatic artery is supplying only the right lobe, the left hepatic artery 
supplying the left. And this is the segment to, this is the branch to segment four is arising from the uh, left hepatic artery. So, uh, and this is the one that uh, the surgeon knows that uh, if they want to do a right hepatectomy, there is no uh, branch crossing over the transection plane. Um, this is an example of replaced right hepatic artery. So you have the SMA and you have a replaced right hepatic artery coming up here. And again, it's just the sole supplier of the right lobe. And this arrow is pointing out to the segment four branch. It was coming off from the left. So this is actually a favorable anatomy for right hepatectomy because the patient will have, uh, or the, 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 the graph will have a single artery and it's rather long artery. So it's a favorable anatomy. Um, two other different um, uh, volume Brendel's NPRs of two different patients. Uh, this patient has accessory right hepatic artery, but then you have this tangle of communication between right hepatic artery uh, branches and the left. And then this patient has a replaced right and an accessory left hepatic artery. So again, um, important to, to relay this information. And again, I think it's the best to be descriptive rather than using classification schemes. This is a case that uh, the right hepatic artery here, this is the segment four branch. So this is coming off of the right hepatic artery. So I think that's a very important uh, information that should be conveyed. I think this case is almost like trifurcation. So I think this is the closest um, diagram that I could find uh, to describe that. And it means that uh, depending on transaction, uh, uh, depending on what lobe they use, uh, this really can uh, can affect uh, the, the transaction plane for the surgeons. And another uh, example here, uh, again, the segment four branch is coming off of the right hepatic artery, so that's a variant anatomy. In this case, it's more uh, internal or more medial inside the liver, and it's a tiny branch, actually. It's a tiny branch that you have to pay a lot of attention to not to miss it. Uh, so it's coming off of the right hepatic artery. We have a left hepatic artery with branching here. Uh, so the patient basically has two uh, suppliers of segment four coming off of their right and left hepatic artery. Hepatic venous anatomy, um, they, are, uh, they have up to 30% prevalence. Um, uh, up to 60% of the patient have a common trunk of the middle hepatic vein and left hepatic vein. Um, the unanticipated variant hepatic venous anatomy may result in excessive bleeding. So if they, they're not aware and they uh, cut that part of the liver, there's going to be a lot of bleeding from that part. Uh, and also, if they're not prepared to make an anastomosis for that aberrant vein, and they just sacrifice and ligate it, that can result in congestion of that part of the graft uh, drained by that vein. So it's very important to, just to uh, prevent graft congestion, which um, affects the outcome. And also to prevent excessive bleeding, it's important to look for these and communicate with this. Uh, so different types, the main ones that are pertinent uh, for this type of transplant uh, surgery is having a large inferior right hepatic vein. So if, if the surgeon is not aware of this, they cut from here, they know about right hepatic veins, so they're going to ligate that and be prepared for anastomosis, but not being um, aware of the large inferior right hepatic vein and cutting through it, they're going to be bleeding. And if not prepared to make another anastomosis, then you're going to have some congestion here. And the other type of variant anatomy for hepatic veins, which is important again, is um, something that we don't usually talk about for other type of uh, studies. It's the draining, big draining veins, the sectoral veins go into the middle hepatic vein. Like this one, if you have a large uh, vein draining segment eight to the middle hepatic vein, and if they're cutting through here, uh, and if they just sacrifice it, uh, then you end up having congestion in segment eight. And as I mentioned, that can affect the, the prognosis. Um, so living donor liver transplant usually needs extensive venous um, uh, venoplasty and reconstruction at the back table. So again, if they know beforehand, they're more prepared to what to do uh, for reconstruction. 
So accessory hepatic vein, we talk about it. So the size matters. If it's too small, then it can easily sacrifice. Uh, there's no real size limit. Some some papers they mention about uh, four millimeter, but it really depends on uh, your center and your surgeons. Uh, uh, I know that uh, our surgeons are more tolerant and they can actually sacrifice up to larger ones. The other one is important to look at and report is the distance between that large accessory hepatic vein and the right hepatic vein IVC um, confluence, because if they're too close to each other, they can just use a large carol patch for the anastomosis, and this is the carol patch. So most of the time when they uh, harvest a vessel, they take some of the IVC or aorta around it so that uh, they have more and more surface to anastomos, and that way the risk of um, an astomotic structure will be less. So if, if these two are like close enough, they can use one patch versus if they're long enough, then they have to choose two separate patches. So usually four centimeter, three to four centimeters is the number they use. But again, it's better to be descriptive and talk to your surgeons to know exactly uh, what they prefer. Uh, and this is an example of large sacral vein to middle hepatic vein. Again, um, the people talk about size of like you know, um, three, four. Uh, if it's less than that, they can like it and sacrifice. More than that, then they have to anastomose. And for anastomosis, they use something that's called jump graft, a venous jump graft. And it could be a synthetic one or it could be something from uh, like deceased donor, different donor. Uh, okay? And that's that's how they try to drain uh, segment eight and five usually, if they have large draining vessels, uh, in many patients normally those two segments drain into the right hepatic vein, but in cases that they drain into the middle hepatic vein, since that vein remains in the donor, now they have to do uh, reconstruction and by use of graft, make sure that that part of the liver is not congested and is adequately drained. Uh, some examples of hepatic venous anatomy. Um, uh, same patient, you have uh, right middle hepatic and left. 60% of patients, there's a short common track of middle and left, so I think that's conventional. And uh, in this patient, uh, most of the right lobe, which will be anterior segment left, is drained into the right hepatic vein. So this is a favorable anatomy for right hepatectomy without need for graft. Uh, again, two other examples. Um, and this is an example of Fiesta FSSP, and uh, you don't necessarily need post-contrast images for venous anatomy and MRI, in my opinion. Many times you can get more information out of your Fiesta T2, and also if you have hepatic biliary phase, that will give you a very, very high contrast resolution because the vessels are dark, and then you have that background liver of being very hyper-intense, so that really helps you uh, to see the veins much better. This patient has a large inferior right hepatic vein, and you can see it again. This is from T2 weighted. This is the very large right inferior hepatic vein. This is a right hepatic vein. Uh, this is the arterial phase from the CT, and patient had a little bit of reflux of contrast, so we're lucky to see them. Uh, and again, if the patient uh, or this donor ends up having right hepatectomy, then the surgeon should decide to have two separate anastomoses and, or one common carol patch for the uh, outflow reconstruction. Another example in this patient, there are actually three veins draining uh, the right lobe, uh, right hepatic vein, and there are two accessory ones. And this is an example, this is an, a coronal image from 20-minute hepatobiliary phase, and here uh, it's a combination of high, higher spatial resolution and high contrast resolution. It's uh, easy to see the veins uh, with better details. An example of a large segment eight vein, instead of draining to the right hepatic vein, is draining to the middle hepatic vein, and assuming that the patient will undergo right hepatectomy, and this will be the transaction plane, this patient will uh, most likely end up getting a graft, a venous graft for, for adequate drainage of segment eight. Poor venous anatomy, which will be the, the last topic we'll, we'll cover. Uh, 20 to 30 percent prevalence is probably, I think, is less important than the hepatic vein and arterial and biliary anatomy. Usually, like it's uh, 
if obviously the, these veins are larger and there are, most of them are extrahepatic, so it's easier to see during the surgery. And most of the time, uh, they don't cause preclusion of uh, the donor to be a donor. <clears throat> uh, so just knowing beforehand, uh, they can affect the plane of resection and type of inflow reconstruction uh, in terms of having one provane in astomosis versus two provane. And again, there are different uh, classification systems, but I think uh, the best thing would be just be descriptive. Just, you know, if you see anything um, non conventional, just describe it the best that you can. You can. Uh, some examples so, this is um, a conventional anatomy. So, you have a common trunk of the main pearl vein and then bifurcation to the right, left, and you have a good length of right pearl vein before. Uh, dividing into the right anterior and right posterior branches. Uh, and this is the MIP images. Uh, this is a different patient. Uh, so this is the conventional anatomy. Uh, this is a case that you have near trifurcation almost. Of, you have a very short or non-existent right provein. So the anterior right provein, instead of coming off from here, has more medial origin. So uh, for the surgeons, it's important to know because probably needs a slightly different venoplasty and reconstruction. This is the same patient. This is the hepatobiliary phase. This is the MINIP, uh, minimum intensity projection. And again, uh, this is this has a very nice contrast resolution between the veins. And I personally find them very useful for venous anatomy, especially hepatic venous anatomy. That uh, CT sometimes is a little bit washed out, especially with MIPS. It's just a little bit harder to see the smaller branches. Uh, another case, uh, there is uh, early branching of the right posterior. Uh, so again, the surgeon will decide if they're going to cut here or cut here and having two anastomoses. Uh, so again, these are pertinent um, variants that we need to uh, to report. So for reporting, um, we have to be very detailed. So include all key information pertinent for this type of surgery. Uh, be descriptive and detailed uh, when defining vascular and biliary anatomy. Uh, the Abby, uh, surgeon who will talk to, uh, tomorrow, he, he asked us a couple of times that just don't say conventional anatomy. Just just describe a little bit more. Even for conventional, um, just make sure that you know you look at everything and we're not missing anything. Um, it's very important to get input from the transplant team to know what type of surgeries and what techniques they do and what they want to get from uh, our reports. Obviously, uh, they're very good at looking at the images uh, and. We should know what to uh, to offer to them in terms of the NPRs and post processing and the reports to complement uh, what they already can gather from looking at the images themselves. Uh, and I think this is one of the areas that is very good for using a templated report. It could be a very systematic templated or the concept of template so that people know what to look at and what to report. And that way, we're increasing the consistency between different radiologists. Um, and uh, hopefully we can add more value. Uh, this is um, just a suggested template and it's uh, courtesy of Natalie Horvat from University of Sao Paulo, uh, what they use there. Uh, at UPMC, we don't have a template now. I mean, uh, most people who read it, they read a lot of them, like they read like few of them each week. So I think they cover everything, but we don't have uh, a templated report which I think would be beneficial, especially for trainees and for some radiologists that might not see these cases on a daily basis. Uh, so we want to comment on liver, the diffuse um, processes, focal lesions. Uh, if there is any anatomic variations, uh, we report the right lobe, left lobe, left lateral segment, and total liver volumes. And obviously, we talk about the arterial, venous, and biliary anatomy in very detail, and we comment about things that we talk about, the origin of segment four, and uh, it's like a large drain air to middle hepatic vein, and so forth. Um, so in conclusion, I think radiologists can add value and work up of liver, living liver donors by ensuring high quality and comprehensive imaging technique and efficient protocols based on the institutional expertise and resources. Uh, we have to ensure uh, high quality and pertinent reports specifically tailored for this indication. 
and it has to be based on the input from transplant team and what they need to get from our reports. Uh, and it's important to be familiar with the surgical techniques. And again, it might be different from center to center. So it's very important to note the techniques mostly done at your institution. And also be familiar with pertinent variants uh, that uh, we discussed. Uh, and with this, I want to thank um, Abby Humar. We'll talk tomorrow, our surgeon, a great, great person and great friend. And also uh, Alessandro Furlan and Anil Dossiam. Uh, my good friends, both from radiology at UPMC, and also I thank um, uh, SAR HCC Disease uh, Focus Panel because we submitted uh, something similar um, uh, as an educational um, exhibit for RSNA and uh, got input from everybody in that panel.